Video editing seems to be a hot topic of sorts these days, especially with the recent launch of AMD's new Threadripper 2 CPUs and high core count chips becoming more and more widespread. Not only that, but everybody and their grandmother is now trying to get into streaming or YouTube. And recording your gameplay to edit it later and upload it to your channel is becoming a real thing. I get asked quite frequently to evaluate people's builds or parts list, and increasingly I'm seeing gaming and video editing as the use for the new system, whereas even a year or two ago it was mainly just gaming. So with that in mind, let's build ourselves a capable gaming machine that can double as an entry-level editing rig. I'm gonna put this video together a little bit differently than others in this monthly build series so far. Instead of just giving you a list of parts that I'm going to use, we can talk about a range of items that might work for any specific purpose. That's why you see so many boxes on the table here in front of me and why I have so little room. But when it comes time to make the donuts, I'll be putting together a system and testing it out like always so you can get an idea of what a potential configuration might do for you. We're gonna start with the most important part of any editing system, and that's of course the processor. Right now, both Intel and AMD are making a case for being the best budget option, believe it or not. As well, AMD offers more cores and threads at every price point, a program like Adobe Premiere can leverage Intel's onboard graphics processor and chop some serious time off of your exports. For this video though, we're gonna stick with AMD. And my first choice for an entry level editor would be either the six core Ryzen 5 2600 or the eight core 2700X. Of course, the first gen Ryzen parts would work just as well. So if you've spied a killer deal on a 1600 or a 1700, I wouldn't fault you at all there. These chips will give us the computational horsepower necessary to scrub through complicated timelines. And over the past year and a half through BIOS updates and better optimization, they've actually also become really good gaming CPUs as well. I would definitely shy away from some of the lower end parts with four cores though, as they likely could become a little overwhelmed as your edits start to get more complex. My choice for this build, the Ryzen 5's 2600. While this isn't necessarily the next most important aspect of our build today, whichever processor you choose is going to be working hard. Across the board, core utilization while exporting videos is often at 95% or higher, and as some exports can take 20 or 30 minutes or even an hour or more, you don't want your processor roasting and subsequently throttling. So for our build today, we're gonna use the new Deepcool Castle 240 RGB cooler. The RGB specifically makes you edit faster, so everybody knows that. But besides its killer looks, this 240 millimeter radiator should do a great job of keeping our CPU at a reasonable temperature. I think this is probably an appropriate size for a Ryzen chip. Although if you go for something like even up to an 8700K or one of Intel's HEDT parts, you might wanna step up to a 360 instead as those can generate a lot of heat. Next up on the list of most important parts, is memory. Video editing eats up memory like I eat up sushi, which is to say quite often and probably while getting soy sauce all over myself. While it's technically true that you can edit videos with as little as even eight gigabytes of memory, no editor worth his salt would be caught dead with less than 16. Especially when dealing with the Ryzen platform, make sure you have a compatible kit of 3000 speed memory or above. This kit of Corsair Vengeance LPX is a great example. You'll be able to run at 2933 MHz without an issue and it has broad compatibility among motherboard manufacturers. Personally though, I like 32 gigs for this task. So for this build, not only will So for this build, not only will we be stepping up our capacity to 32 gigabytes, but we'll also be maxing out our RGB game once again with the Corsair Vengeance RGB Pro kit. Ideally, if I was gonna go for 32 gigabytes, I'd want to have two 16 gig dims if possible versus four eight gig dims, but I think we should still be able to hit our target frequency 
with maybe just a little tweaking. After memory, we're gonna move on to storage. And for this, I actually recommend a couple of different things. One, of course, you'll want a decently fast SSD for your operating system. For this, we're gonna use Adata's SX6512 gigabyte M.2 NVMe SSD. It's not the fastest out there, but it's relatively inexpensive. I got this one for $100 on sale, and it has good initial capacity. Next, you'll also need a larger storage device for your video files. And trust me when I tell you that these things add up fast. I recommend at least two terabytes of mass storage to start with, and preferably more if your wallet can handle it. This is a WD4 terabyte black drive, and I definitely recommend sticking with spinning platter hard disks for this purpose, given the cost difference at this capacity level, especially if this is an entry level system. Additionally, if you're serious about editing, you'll want what's called a scratch disk. This is either a separate partition on one of your drives or an entirely different drive altogether. This is the place where Premiere will store captured video and audio or preview files that it needs to use while you're scrubbing through an edit. If you're familiar with bartending technology, it's basically a speed rail for your editing software. We won't be installing one of these today, but in my main system, I use a second, smaller M.2 drive, and it results in a noticeable boost in smoothness. Our next concern is power, and this goes back to exporting and full system stress for long periods of time. I would definitely recommend an 80 plus gold rated unit if it fits within your budget. For our specific configuration today, I might even feel fine about going down as low as 550 watts or so, but for this build, we're gonna roll with something with a good amount of headroom, the Antec HCG 750 watt power supply. I haven't used an Antec power supply in a build in a long time, but this one actually ticks all the boxes. It's got a 10 year warranty, all Japanese capacitors, it's fully modular, and it says gamer in big bold letters on the side of the box, so that's always a bonus. Of course, we'll want to have a motherboard capable of handling our processor, and preferably one we can also overclock on. So for that duty, we'll turn to the Asus Tough B450M Plus Gaming. This is a micro ATX board, and while of course any B450 or X470 motherboard will likely do just fine, as you'll see in a minute, this is going to be a micro ATX build, and a tough B450 will slot in nicely. You can also go with something like this MSI B450 Tomahawk if you're thinking full ATX, or this Asus RG Strix X470i if you're looking to go even smaller. Just be sure to verify that whichever board you choose has decent power delivery and will allow for a strong overclock, as our 2600 has a lot of work to do. The second to last thing we'll need here is a graphics card. I've done plenty of testing on this, and while it's true that editing software does leverage GPU computational power to help with exporting, color correction, stabilizing, and other functions, it's really just more important that you have a graphics card versus having a really, really expensive one. Jay from Jay's Two Cents also did a full video on this where he benchmarked Premiere using everything down to I think like a GTX 950, and it made only small differences. So the end result here is pick what fits within your budget. I was having a hard time deciding between the EVGA GTX 1060 and this Sapphire RX 580, but I haven't used an RX 580 in any build in what feels like years. So we'll go with this for now. If you're worried about CUDA acceleration, which only Nvidia cards can provide, obviously then, the choice here for you is pretty clear. But CUDA really only matters noticeably when you're adding on adjustment layers like color grading, warp stabilizing, distortion correction, and other more advanced features. For a simple timeline export, the 580 should actually work just great. Lastly, our case. As I mentioned before, this is a micro ATX build and I'll be building in the Corsair Crystal 280X. I've been intrigued by this case since it was announced, and although Corsair was generous enough to send one over quite a long time ago now, it's been sitting unused in my office since then. I hope that we can take advantage of its dual chamber cube design and build a sweet rig in here. And with that, let's get to editing. Or first, 
we have to build it. And then we got to install windows and all those programs and stuff. Then I guess I got to do the benchmarks. Then I have a dinner thing that I have to go to. Then we can edit. All right. I'm gonna say it right now. I love the way RGB vomit looks inside of a white case. It may not be the popular or cool opinion to have, but damn it if I don't just stop and stare at a rig that looks like this every single time. For our testing, I went ahead and tuned in a 3.9 gigahertz overclock on the Ryzen 5 2600, and I was able to get the memory stable at 2933. I tried several different configurations of 3200 megahertz, but I wasn't able to get 100% stability here with different benchmarks crashing at different points depending on what settings I was using and even sometimes the system wouldn't just boot at all. For this reason, I dialed it back a bit and I'm happy with 2933. This resulted in load temps in the high 40s while gaming and I saw peaks of 53C while running Cinebench and 63C while rendering in Blender. There's likely still some headroom here and this is one of the reasons you want to use a cooler like this in an editing PC. This CPU is gonna take some abuse and you wanna make sure it stays well below TJ Maxx. I left the RX 580 at stock clocks for a few reasons. First, overclocking was never the strong suit of Polaris. 
I tried fiddling with it and even bumping up the clock speed to 1450 megahertz from the stock 1411 caused instability in some games. So we'd be looking at a very mild OC at best here. And given the fact that we're building this to be an editing rig, it doesn't make much sense. As you'll see, no difference in Premiere at all. Also, we'd be adding heat to the interior of the case for a very minimal frame rate bump in games. And this just seemed like a poor choice. Regarding our gaming results, I think we're right where we wanna be for 1080p. Everything ran smoothly, even though I generally use ultra settings on everything, and the RX 580 is still a really solid choice at this resolution. You're not gonna be breaking any records in Fire Strike, but I think I'm okay with that. Because this system has a specific purpose, I wanted to add in some rendering and editing results as well. The BMW scene in Blender took six minutes and two seconds to render, a respectable result. My two minute and 58 second, fairly simple 4K project took six minutes and 13 seconds to export in Premiere, so approximately 2x real time. For reference, an extremely high-end processor like the Threadripper 1950X or the Intel i9-7900X will export this same file in just about real time. This isn't bad. This is not a bad result for something that costs a fifth as much. Timeline scrubbing was also relatively smooth at half resolution, although certainly we could have benefited from a scratch disk. I'm extremely impressed by the capabilities of these Ryzen processors. This build turned out better than I expected in multiple ways. And I think if you're in the market for a system that you can game on, stream on, and edit with, this might be the perfect jumping off point right here. Of course, some different choices could have been made as we discussed in the opener. And if you wanna shave a few bucks off of the total, it's certainly possible to do so by reconfiguring the memory, the case, even the graphics card, and maybe even the cooler. But that's kind of how it goes with any build. And you could do a lot worse than a system that's really a jack of all trades. Thanks for watching August's monthly build. Make sure to check out the links down below if you're interested in any of the parts used here, or if you wanna help support the channel directly by becoming a patron or by rocking some BPS Customs merchandise. As always guys, I'll see you next time.